join me as we sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God.
Spirit's already began a good work amongst us this morning. What a wonderful time that we had in Sunday school. Uh, <clears throat> I really intended to have someone else read the scripture today, but I forgot to ask in advance, so bear with me. Romans chapter 8. Sermon title? Read Free at last. Heard that phrase before. I believe there's even a song. But as we look at this passage of scripture, we need to kind of divide it up into categories. There's about there's two different major, and we're only going through verse eleven. There's two major separations, and. Um, the first one's divided into two parts, and the second one has just got lots of information in it. So, let me read it. There is therefore, so then I myself, I'm going back to the last part of verse 29 and verse 7. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Then he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. He spent a great deal of time up to this point separating the law and sin and equating the law with death and even saying that it even causes sin in a sense because of the enticement of the forbidden. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, this is the second part here. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That might be the consummate statement of today's whole message. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, and then he says, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if you... But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The key factor that we're trying to get to in our lives is to that last little section there. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. And he's not just talking about the physical of being alive. But it's through the spirit that is real life that dwells in you. Well, this first section I've just called two words, 
is the word flesh and the word spirit. And these references are also in your bulletin, so if you want to make a little note in there or follow along in that regard, it might be helpful. And there's also basically the same thing on the PowerPoint. When we say the word flesh, we meaning me, I automatically think in my mind of sexual sins. That's just kind of where, and I think that's kind of where everybody's mind goes. But Paul's use of the word flesh in scripture is pretty intriguing because, you know, earlier, he talked about the body, the, the circumcision, that part of the flesh. But he's talking about the physical, but not just the sexual. He also refers to the lineage is that Jesus is from, and he's often called the son of David, or we know he's from the lineage of David all the way down through all of those years since David was king. But he also refers to it in terms of earthly things, earthly pursuits. And in fact, in the book of Galatians, he includes these things as the concept of the flesh. It's still a particular word, but Paul has his own unique application of the word because he broadens it from just fleshly things to idolatry. <coughs> this is in Galatians. Hatred. All sins of the flesh. Wrath. Strife, heresies, envy, murder. You know, when we think of sin, we think of, you know, sin. Adultery, murder, top two probably. That we think of when we just think of the word. But Paul is trying to get across the point that Living in the flesh is a broad concept of earthly existence and the way we live our lives. He brings in idolatry. A lot of people don't worship physical images, but they worship physical things or things that exist. It might be a car, a boat, or a job, or even a person. Hatred, not much needs to be said about that. I often say about what seems to be, you see on media and on whoever speaks up on the news and whatever, it's just, there's just a lot of hate out there. Some people just hate, hate. Period. Not necessarily just people, but anything anybody else does that they disagree with. I mean, they exude hatred. Draft comes right along behind that. Strife. And here's the big one. Heresies. We talked a little bit about that in Sunday school on a certain level. But it's important to address it. Jesus did, and we need to, too, if it comes up. Envy, I never do that. Every time I pass a pickup, I want it. I don't know why I have this fascination with pickup trucks. And I keep thinking my old Tahoe's going to die and I give me a truck. But it keeps on clicking 323,000 miles. And it's still going and blowing. Partially thanks to Caleb <laughs> and his crew. Murder speaks for itself. The 
wrongness, the sinfulness of murder is obvious to us all. But I think Jesus said something about murder that wasn't just the physical act of taking a life. Remember that? It might have something to do with just a person's desire regarding another person. Jesus was very clear about it. I won't spend a lot of time there. I could really go off. <clears throat> but the second word he brings up in this first part of the passage is spirit. And the great division that he's made between the word flesh and the word spirit in this first section really lays us right into the second part of the scripture, which gives a clear view of what our approach should be. This word, spirit, in the Old Testament, it was the word, same word for wind. It's the same in, uh, well, it's pneumos in the Greek. So we get our, our, uh, our phrase, our phrases around air, pneumatic. Uh, but they explain the spirit and the work of the spirit like air. Because it's not something... That you can see, you can't see spirit, but you can see the evidence of it. So, 20 times in this chapter alone, he uses that word spirit. The Old Testament, you remember the rushing mighty wind, the spirit, it always indicated, the word spirit indicates power. That's why they use that concept of a rushing mighty wind. And uh, when, uh, even in the Old Testament, they talked about the Holy Spirit came upon a person. Um, and the Holy Spirit was definitely upon David. Though we didn't have the Holy Spirit then as the same we have now, but in certain situations, God would take the Spirit and move forward something in grand in history because of his spirit. But it's not something you can see. It's like the wind. It's not visible, visible. But you can see the result of it, the evidence of it. And the real key factor, of, of course, I was talking about the Holy Spirit, is that the whole concept here, especially, is that it's spiritual. I mean, it's divine. It's not from a human source. And then we get into him saying, this power, this magnificent divine entity called the spirit, the power that goes with that is within us when we have Christ. So because this great dynamic power lives within us, we have, when we come to Jesus and Jesus comes into our life, we have a new opportunity for victorious living. The way life should be lived according to God, God's will, God's ways. And that's the thing, Jerry, we were talking about in Sunday school that the Jewish folks were having such a hard time grasping what Jesus was all about. And his whole idea with Jesus was he was trying to get to move them away from the physical acts of obeying the law to releasing themselves from that. And Paul goes into it in great detail here in, in chapter 7, especially in where he divides up the law. And what the law does and its capability and what it does for us and what it does to us. Because it really becomes an enticement because all those things that are forbidden, our natural human instinct wants to go do them because if nothing else is curiosity. It must be a good thing if they don't want me to do it. I was never like that as a child, by the way. It's okay to giggle. 
But this opportunity for victorious living is living above our natural instincts. Jesus talked about the fact that we were born in Adam. That we, 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 we share uh, Adam. We share our nature with Adam. We have that same nature. And the reason Adam and Eve sinned was because the nature was already there. God created them with the ability to make a choice and they didn't make the right one. Because they were enticed. They were deceived. And that's what happens with sin. We share that nature with Adam but we share the victory that Jesus won over sin on the cross. So we're a part of that. What we're moving toward here is a little bit different view of the way that we want to live. So we share in Jesus' goodness. We share in Jesus' perfection because of what he has done. We bring disobedience to God. But he brought to us the power to obey and follow. And the key is it's not our power. It's his. And we can't maybe fully explain it. I remember an evangelist one time that explained, he said, I'm a really bad tennis player. But if I could take John McEnroe and stuff him inside of me, I could be pretty good. I'd have better reaction time. I'd have better response. I'd have a better serve. I... And he's was using that to explain what happens when God comes into our life. Jesus, for a purely human concept, stuffs himself inside of us. And we have a whole new way that we can look at things, a whole new way we can react to things, a whole new way we can move forward on a day-to-day -day basis. We brought disobedience, he brought us the power. And we totally understand that this is what we need to turn our day of living into. Then Paul steps across a little threshold here from kind of explaining the flesh and explaining the spirit the two ways that we can approach life, two ways we can live. He says in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And he's talking about the whole gambit of human nature. He's not just talking about fleshly stuff. He's talking about the whole idea of whatever we have a propensity to do as human beings. So, he uses the word dominate, which I think is a, is a good concept and a way for us to look and approach. You're dominated, you're absorbed by the things of wealth and dreams or love and day-to-day -day circumstances. And it comes down to to what have you given your heart, your heart of hearts, the, the core of your being? Where are you? What are you pursuing? He tells us in this passage that to pursue the things of the flesh, and that includes that whole gamut of earthly things that I mentioned uh, earlier with the idolatry and the hatred and the wrath and heresies, envy, murder, and so on. All of those things lead to, he says, the flesh is the way of spiritual yeah. extinction. You know, we were talking about earlier uh, singing about heaven. 
We need to think about it, sing about it more. Because heaven is real. Heaven is our hope. Heaven is a reality that we can count on someday in the future. Still got to go through this life. Still got to put up with the people, put up with the circumstances. But we don't have to just put up. We can live up to those circumstances and things and people because of what Christ has done for us. Because the power, remember, is not our own, but it's in us. And we can move forward in that same power. But it's about the choices and the way that we think about everything, the way that we look at everything, the way, our, our personal view. And if it's on the fleshly, worldly pursuits, then we're going the opposite direction of God's design, of God's will. And that's what he's trying to get across here. On the other hand, he says, if you're dominated by the things of the Spirit, let's read what he says. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. I ran across a phrase. Well, it's right here. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He says it specifically in verse 8. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So it's about the way we think of ourselves and what we are capable of, because we're not capable of, of living God's way without understanding and pursuing and thinking a lot about the things of God. What does the scripture say? As a person thinks in their heart, that's who they are. We are who we think we are. In spite of that phrase that people like to say to other people, who do you think you are? Well, I know who I am. I'm just not sure I always live up to the standard that's in there. But the spirit control is a good word. Spirit-controlled life is a life that I like to think of it as you never stop figuring stuff out. You, you never stop trying, but you never stop learning. You never stop moving forward in the Spirit. Y'all need to listen faster. What do you reflect on when something happens? Do you bounce it off of the concepts that God has taught us over all these years and we know? I like to call it reflecting on what's presently happening around us and to us and with us and realizing that God is the source and can bring us out of whatever. I also like to think of every circumstance that comes along, we just bounce that off of what we know about God's will. It is never God's will to obey a command that is immoral. Never. No matter who gives it. So bounce every circumstance, everything, every happening, even statements, off of what scripture has to say. We set our goals with a spiritual outcome in mind. It's okay to have physical, earthly goals because we live on this earth and we must have some visible means of income in order to do things that we're supposed to do, like eat food. <laughs> so we set our goals with spiritual thoughts in mind I was very privileged for 20 years Betty and I traveled a 
Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Recording large convention events, usually state annual meetings and evangelism conferences were the top two, but then there were others that got intermingled in there. And there's a few sermons I've heard. You know, every one of those conferences has about at least 10 to 12 sermons. I've heard a few. <laughs> Went to all those conferences for all those years. There's a few that stand out. One I've never forgotten, and I can never get all of the details right, okay? <clears throat> but Tony Evans from Dallas, pastor there for many years, fabulous church, fabulous if you've been exposed to any of his teaching, you, you've been had life-changing concepts and consequences because Tony's got an amazing approach to living, an approach to communicating in grace. Now, reverting back to the concept that Betty and I were recording all those conferences, we started off with cassettes. Only a minor nightmare. Then we moved forward to CDs. We were doing VHS tapes, which you only can record in real time. Unless you got really big expensive gear. And then we moved to DVDs. And then we moved to jump drives. And even sent a few files via the internet toward the end. But Tony's church at that time was making hundreds of CDs every week to send to people and make them available to the congregation if they wanted to hear or see the sermon again. And so he used this analogy about we who are Christians, when we stick a master CD into a duplicator, and we put the five other units in there that are blank. After several minutes, after you press the go button, you have five exact replicas of that master CD. I hope you can already figure out where I'm going. But this was, and there's a term, if you have them commercially done, they don't call it duplication, they call it replication. It's the same thing. When you get the replicated CD in your hand, it is an exact copy, word for word, volumes the same. Everything is exactly the same as the master. As we follow Jesus, our master, our goal. What did Paul say? You're predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's always our goal. Amen? Amen. So, how do you get there? It's a journey. Paul said in his latter years, I ain't there yet, but I'm not giving up. I'm keeping on, keeping on. I'm moving forward. I put the past in the past, and I'm moving ahead with Jesus. My words. In that same sermon, Tony laid out another analogy. And as we walk and talk in our daily life, we're walking and talking with Jesus. That's the best company you can have. That's the best company you can keep. And when Tony was closing out that message, I'll never forget, 
Tony, I apologize. I do not have all these details down to the nth degree like you so eloquently put it. But he called it. It's about who you go with. The privileges and the things available, it's about who you go with. He was talking about a person that he knew, perhaps one of his staff, I, I don't recall, who made a comment about going to the game. Well, Tony is a chaplain of the Dallas Mavericks, I believe it is. And the guy was talking about, man, I really want to go to the game, but man, all that traffic. Then you got to park. Then you got to walk. It seemed like five miles to get to the to the floor and, and sit there and sit among all the sweaty other people and the loud crowd and all of that. I think in his heart of hearts, Tony just smiled. He said, why don't you go with me? I have a private entrance. I have my own parking space. And we're right outside the locker room. We get out of the car. We've got just a little ways to go. Get to be with the team. Get to meet the guys. Oh, and, and, and the traffic leaving. He said, we've got our own exit. We've got our own exit. We don't even see the other traffic. It takes you an hour to get out of three blocks of downtown Dallas. <coughs> or wherever the arena is now. I think it was still in the old one now. Then, but, <coughs> and I thought, if we could grab on to that idea, the one with Jesus, the privileges are different. You get to park in a different place. And your ultimate goal is guaranteed. Heaven. David loved to sing, this world is not my home. Can I get a witness? Amen. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I want to sing a little bit of a song just to kind of wrap it up. How we spend our time, how we spend our thought life, how we spend our spare time reading and what we read. This song just came to my mind this morning, and I asked Bess, is that a hymn? I'm not sure if it was. I'm going to sing it if you want to sing it with me. It's 587, but you probably don't really need it. It's take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him all.
thank you for your word. Sometimes it seems like we're walking through some tall weeds. Please help us to never lose our perspective. That we belong to you. You are inside of us, moving us forward with each step that we take. And I praise you, Lord, that today as we leave this place, even though it's cold outside, it's warm in here, and the warmth of the Holy Spirit has impressed upon us the need to be more, to have more of a concentration in our lives on you. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would move us forward this week that will be at least a little bit different than we were last week. Because it's your journey happening inside of us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.